The Creature Files, presented by the Department of Mythical Wildlife, with your hosts, author Todd Calgi Gallicano, Christopher McClary at the Sightings Desk, and resident skeptic Vic Afsahi. So sit back and listen as we report the latest news and up-to-date information about the mythical creatures living among us. The Creature Files. It might just save your life. Greetings and welcome to The Creature Files, the show that's all about mythical creatures. That includes cryptids and creatures from folklore, anything that might be lurking in the woods, in the waters, or in the skies. I'm your host, Todd Calgi Gallicano, the author of the Sam London Adventure series from the files of the Department of Mythical Wildlife. And you can learn more about us online at mythicalwildlife.com. Now it's time to introduce my co-hosts, Chris McClary at the Sightings Desk and not-so-skeptic Vic Afsahi. Hey, guys. Hey, hey, good to see you again. How's it going? Now, before we continue, I do want to make a very special announcement to those fans who haven't heard the news yet. I'll simply say the search begins April 13th, 2021. That's right. The third book in the Sam Lennon Adventure series, Search for the Swan Maiden, releases in April of 2021. And we'll be doing a big cover reveal with pre-order information, as well as some other fun opportunities in the coming months before the release. But not too long to go before you can get your hands on Search for the Swan Maiden. Okay, on to my background. As many of you know, every book in the Sam Lennon Adventure series features a few of our national parks. And to honor that on my podcast, I always change my background to a national park. The one behind me today has not yet appeared in the books. Maybe it will in the future, who knows. It's a a lesser known park in a state that relates to today's creature feature. No way either of you two get this, but I'll give you a shot. I'd like to guess the state. All right, go ahead. Um, New Mexico. No. That's Butte, Montana. (laughs) That would be a big no. All right. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and read from the National Park site, quote, there is a place in far west Texas where night skies are dark as coal and rivers carve temple-like canyons in ancient limestone. Here, at the end of the road, hundreds of bird species take refuge in a solitary mountain range surrounded by weather-beaten desert. Tenacious cactus bloom in sublime southwestern sun, and diversity of species is the best in the country. This magical place is Big Bend. Big Bend National Park. Now, this may be one of the least visited parks in the park system, but it is also one of the largest. In fact, it includes an entire mountain range. There's 1,252 square miles of land, making it larger than the state of Rhode Island. It features 150 miles of hiking trails through mountainous desert terrain and along rivers. The contrast in geography inside the park is, is truly amazing, and it's a, it's a dark sky park like Death Valley, meaning there's very little light pollution, so it's great for viewing st- the stars. You know, I could go on and on. Uh, there's a lot to, more to learn about Big Bend, but I encourage you all to check it out online and visit if you can. All right, now it's time to get over to the sightings desk with Chris McClary. Now, a lot of people are in lockdown all over the world, so I can't imagine there's been a lot of sightings of mythical creatures. Chris, what do you have for us? Yes, well, Todd, uh, you know, there's some truth to that. The pickings have been a little slim. I I actually think that uh, it's actually allowing the mythical creatures that are out there to come out of hiding and be uh, probably more bold if only we weren't stuck in the house missing out on this. I have this idea that they're all roaming free now and in the forest, if only we could get out there and see them. In fact, uh, Lake Norman strikes again because we recently had another sighting there. Yeah, so what we have is a 35-year-old Mecklenburg County man, and he has described his spotting as a dinosaur-like creature. This was Saturday morning, and he was traveling by boat with friends near the main channel of Lake Norman and they see something splashing around. They watch it for about a minute. Uh, It's described as uh, roughly 10 feet long and reminiscent of, uh, in their words, Loch Ness Monster. So uh, they said it was was visible for about a minute and then uh, it dropped below the surface. And this is in my neck of the woods, uh, Lake Norman, and Normie has been talked about for uh, for a while now. You know, I've spent some time on Lake Norman. I've never actually seen the creature myself, but it does match up to sightings of other lake creatures like uh, the Ogopogo, which we covered in a previous show, uh, Nessie, and uh, and Champ. So um, it is interesting. It has been spotted uh, several times. Um, And uh, I will note that Lake Norman is a man-made lake. So I'm not entirely sure how a lake monster got there in the first place, Um, but it is a phenomenon uh, that is, you know, that has been ongoing. Vic, what do you think? 
Well, I think how it got there is it probably crawled out of the imaginations of the Lake Norman Tourist Board. Uh, because in the 50 years that we've had sightings, they haven't even thought to set up a webcam to let the public view what could possibly be this creature. So uh, the vain imaginings of a Mecklenburg man might be enough for Chris, but I would like to see in the age of live streaming and video conferencing and social media, a single photo of something. All right, now it's time for the creature feature. And this week we're covering the chupacabra. The notorious chupacabra or goat sucker is a monstrous little beast that is known to drain the blood of its victims. It supposedly performs this macabre act through a bite to the chest. Although there are reports of animal deaths in 1975 that match the description of the chupacabra, contemporary reports claim the first sighting of the creature occurred in the mid 90s in Puerto Rico, where it killed eight sheep. The animals were found with those puncture wounds and were drained of blood. It's pretty gross. Another sighting occurred months later and was linked to the deaths of as many as 150 farm animals. Since those sightings in Puerto Rico, there have been reports of the creature all over Central America, South America, the Dominican Republic, the United States, and Mexico. In the United States, Texas has been one of the big uh, hot spots for sightings of the little monster. Now, if we look at folklore, uh, we do see similar creatures in some of the mythologies in South America and even in, in the Philippines and Asia. Now, according to reports, the chupacabra stands about three feet tall and has a reptilian body, though there are variations that are more canine-like. Their legs are long, like a kangaroo, and their backs sport a row of sharp spines. The face of the monster has glowing red eyes, a protruding jaw with long fangs, and a forked tongue. But could it be a hairless dog or a coyote with a skin disease? Researchers who have studied the DNA of some of the supposed bodies of the chupacabra claim that's what they are, you know, nothing more than maybe a coyote, a dog, even a raccoon. So what's the real story here? Let's find out with our guest. We have former host of the Venomous Fringe, cryptozoologist and enthusiast, Chris Edge with us. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Hey guys, good evening. Thank you again for the opportunity. I'm very glad to be here. Awesome. Now, uh, first of all, we'd like to ask you, so how did you get involved with cryptozoology? The origins of me starting cryptozoology, it all, it all came back when I was just a, a little boy back in the early 2000s. I, I started... When you're at an age where you're able to understand what a TV is presenting to you, that was basically me. I remember when Lifetime was airing Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack, the original, back when they were, when they were on that channel. And I would be sitting with my grandmother and we would be watching these shows. And then they had the one about the skunk ape in Florida. And, and, and that episode stuck with me so much because I was like, wow, that thing is hairy and, and it looks weird. And then... I was introduced to learning how to use a computer. And from there, I typed up a few things about strange, hairy creatures and Bigfoot popped up. And, and from ever since then, I, I was introduced to cryptozoology thanks to Unsolved Mysteries and even, even shows like In Search of the great late uh, Spock, Leonard Nimoy, you know, shows like that. YouTube in the, in the early age presenting all these older clips. So cryptozoology all began for me back in 2003. So have you uh, ever seen a chupacabra or, or seen what you believe to be the remnants of one? Uh, what can you tell us about the chupacabra from your own experiences talking with people and studying the creature? Well, I have never seen a chupacabra. I've actually had a family member who was in Puerto Rico who told me an interesting case a while when he was a little kid in, in the early 70s in reference to the chupacabra. We'll get into that in, in a bit. But uh, for me, I've never seen one. And... My, what I know about the creature, Chupacabra is one of those cryptids that spawns back from the early 90s in South America. Often some people have often considered it to be like the modern day vampire almost mm -hmm. in South America because a lot of people would report farm animals that were killed, dozens if not more. People would often call in and, and the police would be questioning the deaths because it wasn't like it was a serial killer or anyone doing it it was actually just uh a the the the, the puncture it would be like a puncture wound with the blood drained out of the livestock and it was just one of those um things where locals and even authority were questioning what this could be there there's always been that mythology and idea in south america depending on what magic that one studies, 
that for many would think, well, could this just be the act of a cult? Could this be the act of something more supernatural? So the, the reactions to that back then were pretty mixed. And, and even now in, in North America, because there's, uh, there's been different uh, distinctions and different types of chupacabras. We've often had the reptilian types and we've had the canine, rabid, coyote looking ones that we've often seen and heard of in North America. Mm-hmm. But for going back for, what, uh, for chupacabra, um, often there is been a lot of cases where people do think it was kind of just one of those brushings runs of the imagination because of it looking similar to a creature from a film and on top of that because it does a lot of the reports in north america say it does look like a coyote and people think it could be a coyote with mange but open openly though for what is known about it it is one of those creatures that is explored, but I think is explored more in the, in the ropes like Bigfoot, where it is mainstream, where people can talk about in such cases. It's not like Dogman or Goatman, where it's hard to convince the public about an upright walking canine or an upright mm. goat looking creature, so to speak. I totally agree. Like, it seems as though the Chupacabra is a little bit more accepted Mm. as a, as a cryptid, (laughs) like more of a a possibility. Now, what credence do you put into uh, the researchers who claimed it's nothing more than that, you know, a hairless dog or, or some other creature with mange or, or what have you? Credence is is a good way of, uh, is an interesting term to use because there have been a lot of people, and as mentioned, skeptics who think it is just a hairless dog with mange or, or some sort of coyote with mange. There was one researcher, and if you guys want to look him up, you can. His name's Benjamin Radford, and he wrote a book in 2011 called Track in the Chubacabra, and he actually traveled to South America, and he actually ran into one of the original eyewitnesses in Puerto Rico, and the point is, is that he was very skeptical himself. And he had, he, he, much like other skeptics, were concerned about the idea, well, could this thing just be one of those type of hairless animals? And when he went to Puerto Rico and started coming up about with all reports of eyewitnesses and would come forward, he really was taken aback at the fact that, okay, it's not just a bunch of BS. People in this country have actually seen something they can't explain. And the credence when it comes to other researchers out there, I think it's easy to point out because like I mentioned, it is one of those creatures that could be taken as mainstream and understand because of the way it looks. Because when we do think of Chupacabra in North America, we think of those dogs or those um, coyotes. We don't think of the reptilian looking type. So skepticism, I think in that would be huge, especially because when I originally looked up the Chupacabra and I looked up North American brand, I actually thought it was a, a dog or a coyote with mange, but the more I looked at the cases and, and more of the reports that involve the way it kills, it doesn't sound like your typical coyote dog kill. I think a coyote, a dog, especially with their genes and what they have instinct wise would be a much more violent kill, especially with livestock. So, um, Okay. And, you know, the, I, researching this and kind of looking at this for the, for the show and also, you know, the Chupacabras in book one of the Sam London Adventure series. So I, I did a lot of sort of research into the Chupacabra at that point. Um, and there was a suggestion that that original sighting back in 1995 was just due to the witness having watched the movie Species. Now, I mean, I, I've seen that movie. I can't imagine how they connected the Chupacabra to that, but maybe I'm forgetting something about it. Uh, did you hear that as well? I did. And it's funny that you brought it up because Species was one of the very first horror films I watched. And when I had looked at it, I was very, because when Unsolved, and and this is the best way I can put it from my history from childhood. I remember when they did the reenactment of the Chupacabra and they had the alien looking, reptilian looking thing with the red eyes and the scaly back and the reptile look. And when you look at Species and you see two very similar creatures, is it ironic that it came out the same year that the first sightings came out? Absolutely. But Mm -hmm. I also think, too, that if this was, in fact, the playoff of the imagination that perhaps maybe the eyewitness, because the original eyewitness um, uh, was named Madeline uh, Tolentino, and she had reported that she had seen the film a while back before her first sighting of this, of the Chupacabra. So it does add into that allude of that. And as mentioned, so I think it's just a coincidence could it just be that maybe, but then how do you explain the thing with 
what it does, like the goat sucking aspect of it, where how it drains blood. We heard about that original sighting in, in the 90s. Is there any other particular sightings or accounts that you believe are the most credible and why? Well, you know, it's interesting because even before 1995, often there's been a, uh, a contradiction that the Chupacabra sightings didn't start coming about until 1995. But I personally believe that they've been around for more than the past 25 years. I believe that it became it was first reported, but I don't think it was at that time of the year where it was a span. But that when it comes to some reports, you hear about in Maka in 1975, apologize if I butchered the, the name of the city, but there was reports of similar killings in the residential area of that country in South America, and they credited as El Vampiro del Moca, which is the Vampire of Maca translation. So do I, I, when it comes to credibility, or, or at least ones that I find of that, I do believe because of, the, of that city's history. I had mentioned that I had a family member back in the 70s who had reported something very similar when they were little kids and that when they when it was translated to me i i definitely put it through a translation as it was best described to me they had said that they were in the woods and they were just playing around and stuff and they had seen giant scaly animal and it was one of those looking meanest looking things and they it just carried on but it ran off and he would always make this joke and they'd say watch out for the chubacabras at night they'll come and get you out of the woods so it it, it kind of alludes to that so when they were younger they had seen this thing so obviously it seems in puerto rico that this is not you can knock on someone's door right and you can happenly see that yeah someone knows about the chubacabra because it's mm -hmm. notable there so that was an interesting case. I think a lot of the 1995 reports with livestock and even reports now, I do believe that people are seeing something out of the blue. At first glance, it can be a coyote. Absolutely. I'm sure we can always try to build that one thought in our heads. Well, did we really just see that abnormal thing or is it just something like, or was it just another zoological creature that we know of? So a lot of the sightings in 1995, especially the farm cases, are I take to be extremely credible, especially when you have photographs on the internet of people saying, listen, my goat literally had its body. It's still here. It's not ripped to shreds, but it's drained completely of blood. What animal does that? So I don't think the uh, townspeople in 95 were just all coming together thinking it was okay to come to say, let's, let's make up a story of, of a movie, of a creature in a film that we had just seen and turn it into something and have our goats cut up and, and drain the blood to make it look like some sort of sick act. If, if anything, that that would just, to me, be totally biased. But I've always believed the cases because I don't think, and, and on top of that, with the help of that family member of mine, because I don't think they would just come to me and, and keep in mind, they don't, no one would know that I do talk cryptids or anything so it was totally on this to me but when they mm -hmm. told me that i was taken aback i was like wow you know about chupacabra and i even met, and i just happened to say oh chupacabra had the blue neat so, so and in terms of the the sightings in the united states so the, the sightings in texas mm -hmm. and a couple of other places is there anything that you can tell us about those in particular there was an infamous video i don't know if it's still on youtube and i don't i don't know if there was ever any closure to it there was a, a patrol uh, there was a, a dash cam footage of uh, two officers. I don't know if it was Texas or New Mexico. And they were chasing this creature running on all fours. They thought it was a chihuahua. And it was just chasing. It was just, they were driving and they were just following this thing while it was running away. But it didn't look like a dog or a coyote. It looked like something totally different. And a lot of cases in Texas, there are some people who often seen the case of rabid coyotes running around or coyotes running in packs or even some reports seeing even coyotes injured and it's not like a car hit it and large predator hit it something obviously took it out but they don't know and on top of that texas being a very interesting state for its bigfoot dogman reports and other unknown creatures so chupacabra in those uh, states in the south in the southern u.s respectfully um there's definitely something there I don't believe it to be coyote and I don't believe it to be a coyote with mange because just the way some of these cases go about with the description 
of how it literally tear like it doesn't tear apart its its prey it just does the same thing as a normal reptile like chupacabra in south america and it just makes me wonder it's like well why would a predator like that just do that instead of just going ahead and just tearing it like a normal bear would tear open a deer for example but see also too there have also been like historians who have stuffed creatures that have had creatures come in stuffed i'm sorry not themselves doing it but um they would have these in one museum, I believe, in one of the, uh, in, in somewhere in Texas, where they have a stuffed coyote looking creature with mange, they believe to be as what they, what it looks like to be a coyote with mange, but believe they say they believe to be a chupacabra. So mm-hmm. I do think that in those states, because they do look so similar to what we see as coyote and, and regular uh, dogs, that there's something more abnormal and it's not. Uh, it's not one of those creatures I just said. I believe it is something totally different, something totally new. And I also think that that's something that should be more explored, especially because Chupacabra, it is a very mainstream, uh, to me, I think it's a mainstream name, but it has a lot of questions, but not a lot of answers, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, for our listeners that want to know um, more about the, the sort of the distinct signs of the creatures that they should be aware of in order to avoid an unwanted encounter. Um, mm. Is there something, that you, can you tell us a little bit about um, what the creature's like, what it looks like, uh, how you might, you know, know whether it's in the vicinity? In, a, in the 95 reports, a lot of the, re, um, a lot of, eyewitnesses were able to get a good idea that it was near by looking at the red eyes because the illumination in the woods and for those in North America, the, the biggest sign I would say would be if, as if it would be a normal uh, canine looking at you, observing you at first before it makes its approach very similar to how wild animals are. Those are the big signs I guess you would want to look out for when you're looking at for if you're in South America, because I haven't really heard a lot of reports going back to it being that reptilian looking one, but in conjunction, the biggest thing you want to look out for is the initial eyesight. There's also been cases where it's believed to have hissed, so like a hissing sound, which alludes to that reptilian type uh, discussion, and then also to a site of growling if that makes sense so those Mm -hmm. are some of the bigger signs to look out for but see how you could tell it's a chupacabra like i said with the reptilian type stance with the eye shine and and, in a normal sense a totally a a coyote that isn't a coyote it doesn't look it looks totally not i wouldn't say disfigured but one that if the thing doesn't man it doesn't have coyote like instincts or dog like instincts that's the sign right there to just back away if that makes Mm -hmm. sense for now for those viewers that want to learn more about the chupacabra what kind of you mentioned a book earlier what other kinds of resources do you suggest uh, for them to look into there's a book by benjamin radford that he had called the tracking the chupacabra and in the book he describes his beliefs on it he describes the reports that we talked about and he and he also went to puerto rico and other south american countries to interview people about it so that's a good book to look into Um, when it comes to other resources i've always seen a lot of internet uh factuals to be also a good outlet for people out there who aren't necessarily who are new to chupacabra i've always thought that um Brittania or or Brittanica B R I T A N N I C A. I may have butchered that name, but that mm-hmm. is also a good website that was it has a bunch of good facts on it, and also too, I know that there there's not been a lot of documentaries put on the creature, but if you really wanted to look into some of the pop culture, you can look at like the X-Files and they did an episode called El Mundo Gira, which was the search of the Chupacabra in that one episode. Um, It was used on shows like Grimm. It made its Mm -hmm. own movie. Uh, But like, if you wanted to get into the pop culture side of it, um, 
but also to that book tracking the chupacabra has probably been one of the more resourceful books i actually picked it up at a barnes and noble about five years ago and it's it's very informative so if 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 your listeners want to look at something that is extremely informative um that would be one to look into uh as a as a resource um and there's also another there's also another good one too um you have books like bar if you if if your listeners want to look at barnes there's one called terror by moonlight it's called chasing the chupacabra that one just popped in my head okay That's, that's another good one Okay, great. Now let me bring in my co-hosts, uh, Chris and Vic. Chris, do you have any um, questions for Chris? Oh boy, I do. <laughs> uh, boy, do I have questions, absolutely. Um, I don't know if we have time for the cool questions I have, but let me just start by saying, I have really been looking forward to this particular episode, Todd. I'm, I'm really glad you, you booked uh, Christopher. Um, this, this creature holds a special place in my heart because you know, when I was young, and I don't know if it was a Scooby-Doo episode, I feel like it might have been a Scooby-Doo episode. Todd, do you know, was there, was it? There, I think there was a Scooby-Doo was, movie right. with yes. the Chupacabra, yes. Because, I mean, I remember being 100% true believer from day one about this creature because it just, it just added up to me. Mm. It made sense that, you know, they're finding these carcasses that are drained in this mysterious way that no creature that we've heard of, no, no normal animal does. So, and it just seemed very plausible. So, you know, I've, from that's probably my oldest and earliest, you know, um, quote, mythical creatures that I've, I've sort of believed in. Um, so hearing your account and hearing all of your knowledge on this has been really awesome to, uh, to hear and just uh, all the information you've been able to bring today. So thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions I have, uh, because you said on the, the police one, it was like maybe more Chihuahua size. I have always been under the impression that it is larger and, and yeah, while it's sort of like dog, like it does have a different kind of stance. It sort of sits back on haunches, mm-hmm. uh, almost more like a, a creature that, you know, it, it can use its arms unlike a dog too. Uh, now is that, is that accurate? Cause that's how I seem to remember this creature being, you know, from when I was young. I've, I've heard of it. And, and in that sense, but I've always kind of seen it as an observation in many reports where it's just like it stands in that stance because of observation. There's been cases where people, when they've reported dogmen and they've seen um, the way it'll like its bone, its joints will pop and, and it make that pop effect at when it, when it's running or it's observing. And I think of it very similar with chupacabras in that case. And that's what, that's why I said it, it, it stands out a bit more if compared to your coyote and dog because of some of the way, it, some of its characteristics. And I, I, that Scooby-Doo, uh, that was the Scooby-Doo monster of Mexico. I remember watching that when I was a kid. So that was very good. That's from what you're, where you're getting that reference from with Scooby-Doo. That that's was- it. And I'm going to tell you, that is probably the source of more. I went camping a lot when I was a kid. There you go. And that is probably the source of more heebie-jeebies when I was a kid. And I lived in Ohio. There was really not much of a threat probably being from Ohio, but it didn't matter. Once that was in my head, that creature was out there. And I was, I just remember every time we went camping, and I was like, there was an excitement around the possibility of something like that in the darkness. All right, Vic, do you have any questions for Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's interesting. The Chupacabra I mean, I, I remember first hearing about this thing in probably the mid to late 90s. Um, and I remember seeing a video at some point in the 2000s where maybe Chris McClary might have seen the same one where it was, it was at night and it was like down like a road. And all you see are the, the red eyes light up. And then this thing that looks some, some, something like a cross between a kangaroo and a coyote and a, you know, vampire um and 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 it was it's harder to fake videos back then so i I don't know what it was or or where it came from but that is also my the impression in my head visually um it's interesting but is is the chupacabra a global phenomenon or is it sort of limited to the americas in terms of the stories that we hear about it i think it's uh limited because i've never really heard a lot of reports in europe asia uh, Australia, and I've never really thought of it as a creature that was no more than just part of the Americas. And I think yeah. because the, where it's at, I mean, 
if you really look at the map, North America, South America, it, it's very easy for a creature to just easily trail through the deserts of, of Mexico yeah. to cross the border and easily, because a lot of the reports people are citing this, it's, it's mostly in Texas and New Mexico, which are literally mm. right there. So it makes me think this thing can migrate and maybe there's di these different variants could be maybe this one creature solely the creature that looks like in South America, Puerto Rican variant of the chupacabra. Could it easily be a completely new different species that's able to breed with other animals and exceed DNA to have that downright play of it looking like this coyote? It could possibly considering how DNA works. I don't know. I don't think it could, especially crossbred, but it is a possibility. I do think though it's only limited to these states and to the U S and to South America solely though. Yeah. The other thing I was curious about is I, cause I've heard the reports of the cattle being found mm -hmm. completely drained of all liquids, basically blood and whatever, but otherwise being intact. And in your research, is there any other animal that feeds like that or would hunt like that? You know? Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. It, while it wasn't, it's close to the specifics, but it wasn't as reported because of the drastic measure of what was going on, the energy in the town at the time. But it reminds me of when there was mysterious cattle mutil not mutilations, there was mysterious cattle deaths in 66 and 67 with the Mothman mm. in West Virginia. There were people, there were farmers who would call the, sh the sheriff's department and say, hey, there's these, our farm animals are dead, but doesn't look like someone or something ripped them to shreds. They would only be like blood drainage, which was <laughs> freaky to me. And that added that a thought to, of like, it reminds me of that with Chupacabra because I'm like, wow, the hypnotic red eyes, so spot on, very similar to both creatures. And it, it, it would be, and something of that nature just chomping this sucking the blood so i've always thought the cases were similar to the cattle deaths with mothman but no other cryptid or no other um unknown species i think has done that and if there is maybe someone of the audience or or down the road might say another overall but that's the only one that comes to mind all right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us and talking about the Chupacabra today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, guys. I want to thank you guys again for having me come on the show. Please keep on searching for the unknown. All right. That was Chris Edge, um, special guest talking about the Chupacabra. So let's go for some final words from uh, my co-hosts, Chris and Vic. You guys got any more to say about the Chupacabra? Yeah. You know, I, I really enjoyed that. And, you know, while he was talking, I was, I was sort of meant to bring this up and I, I kind of we got into other things, but um, part of it made me wonder about um, with all the, you know, all the blood draining and stuff, you know, what about large vampire bats? You know, I mean, I live here in, in Nevada, we have very small bats, but could larger, I know bats can get pretty sizable and maybe they can't do a drink an entire cow, uh, blood from an entire cow, but maybe the smaller animals like a goat, I don't know. Vic, you got uh, any thoughts? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, what's interesting about the chupacabra is the consistency with which we find evidence of it. So in, in North America, we have the drained cows. In South America, we have the drained goats. Uh, there's, I think it'd be impossible to coordinate similar incidences in different villages and farms and, and, and you know ranches or whatever with, with that level of consistency across that much land and countries and, and things like that. So there's definitely something out there that is sucking the blood out of these creatures and otherwise leaving them intact. And there's no other animal that I'm aware of or have heard of that can do it. Vampire bat, yes. Entire goat and cow? I, I don't think so for a bat. Yeah, that would have to be a pretty sizable bat, I imagine. Um, and, a bat uh, man. <laughs> bat man <perhaps. laughs> okay, well, I want to thank you all for joining us for this episode of The Creature Files. And we invite you to go to the website at mythicalwildlife.com and vote in our online poll about the chupacabra, whether you believe it's real or just some hairless dog. Um, you can also report a sighting on the site and, and even uh, maybe wind up on the show. 
Um, don't forget to follow us on Facebook. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, subscribe. Uh, it really helps us out. And also for those fans that are interested in more news about Search for the Swan Maiden, we'll be posting that stuff on Facebook through the website and, uh, and the trailer for the, for the book will um, wind up on YouTube as well. So you definitely want to subscribe to those. Well, thanks again. And uh, until next time, always remember to heed your call to adventure. The Creature Files. It might just save your life.